morning. Uh, my name is George Perkovich. I'm a vice president for studies here at the Carnegie Endowment. I'm also a co-editor uh, Eli Levita of the book that we're here to uh, launch, Understanding Cyber Conflict, uh, published by Georgetown University Press. And thanks to uh, the generosity of the Hewlett Foundation, uh, the book is also available um, online to be downloaded for free on a chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis or in its entirety. If you're interested in doing that as opposed to buying a hard copy outside or through your favorite bookseller, uh, you could just Google Understanding Cyber Conflict and you'll see the link or go to the Carnegie website. I just want to say uh, very briefly um, the, the impetus for the book were a number of discussions that, that we had uh, over the last few years with senior policymakers in about 10 countries uh, trying to get their sense of how they were understanding the cyber uh, challenge that they faced. Uh, and, and many of them uh, spoke about both the natural tendency of themselves and, and their, their colleagues or their seniors uh, to use analogies to think about cyber, because that's the way human beings tend to think. Uh, and, and these people that we were talking with, many of whom were, were professionals in the cyber domain, were saying a lot of time the analogies are, are misleading. And it would be great if somebody uh, would, would help us uh, unpack those. And uh, one of the people who, who really encouraged us to do that is, is on our panel later, uh, Emily Goldman. Uh, and she and John Arkia had, had done an earlier version of, book, uh, of cyber analogies, um, but thought it could be uh, built upon and, and advanced. And so that's what we've done uh, here with 14 chapters uh, by different authors looking at, at kind of key analogies relating to uh, what are cyber weapons like and what might cyber conflict be like. And then the third section is on, on what might managing cyber conflict uh, be like. So that explores policy options. Um, and like I say, you can, if there's a particular analogy that interests you or a particular challenge, you, you can kind of download it separately or read it separately. Uh, but the book hangs uh, together quite well. What we're going to do uh, now is, is we're going to begin by having a discussion uh, with, with my colleague Eli Levita and Mike Morell, who uh, has graciously um, joined us. Uh, Mike is the former acting director of the CIA. He's with Beacon Global Strategies. He's also, also the author of a fine book, uh, The Great War of Our Time, which I, I have read and profited from and urge you uh, to read too. It's a, it's a memoir, but also a history, a recent contemporary history, um, particularly regarding the, the war on terror. Um, so Ellie and Mike are going to talk for a while, and then we'll, we'll bring the panel up. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good morning to you all. Um, we are fortunate to have Michael here because he's been thinking about these issues long before we started working on the book or even on the original cyber analysis. So with that perspective, Michael, what do you see merely um, old dynamics playing out in a, different, in a new technological realm? And what do you see as something that is, is novel in its, in its aspects, its implications, mm. its consequences, and so on? So I think this is, uh, first, so first of all, it's great to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's an honor to be up here with, with my friend. Um, I think it's, it, it's, it's the question you ask is a fundamental one. Um, it's, it, it's really critical to how we think about this going forward. Um, you know, I'm, I'm part of the, that group who thinks that cyber is um, a new domain. Um, you know, uh, air, ground, sea, space, cyber. Um, I really think about it that way. Um, and I think that's true. And I think it's also true that we feel that we're struggling with this a little bit. And the very fact that you wrote the book, right? And the very fact that you looked for a methodology to try to understand these issues. Um, is a reflection that we feel we're struggling with this. Um, people feel that the United States government is struggling with this. Other governments are struggling with this. 
private sector struggling with this, right? Uh, everybody's struggling with this, and I think when you put those two things together, that this is this is a new domain, um, and that we're struggling with it. I think there's a there's a tendency for people to leap to the conclusion that this is fundamentally different somehow, um, and I don't think it is. I I really don't. Um, I think that that a lot of the tools and policies that we use to manage security in the other domains can be used to think about and manage security in this domain. Um, I think deterrence is a great example of that. Um, one of the most interesting questions is, is why haven't we had a significant attack, cyber attack, on critical infrastructure? Um, why haven't we had the cyber nine, you know, version of 9/11? Why hasn't that happened? Um, and I think the answer to that, despite you know, despite that's the that was the warning we heard from the intelligence community over and over and over again. Um, it's the thing that that Secretary Panetta talks about all the time. Um, why hasn't that happened? The answer is because I think deterrence works. You know, a significant attack on critical infrastructure would not be under the radar, would require a significant response from the nation state that was attacked. And I think the adversary knows that, and they, 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 they won't go there because deterrence works. Um, I, I also think it's, it's very similar in, in another interesting respect, and that is that, that covert operations are much more difficult to respond to than overt operations, and therefore more difficult to deter. And that's true in, in the, the, the four domains that we've lived with for quite some time, and this, this new domain. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the physical world, one of the things that always struck me, um, and I've thought about this for a long time, and I've never really uh, figured it out, and I think it'd be a great PhD dissertation, um, is that the Iranians, dating way back to the first Beirut bombing, the bombing of the, of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, have killed Americans. Um, Beirut Embassy bombing, Marine barracks, Kobar Towers, um, providing EFPs to Iranian uh, Shia militia, uh, to, to, to Iraqi Shia militia, um, and the United States never responded to any of those. They never responded. And the, 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 the key reason, I think, is because they were covert. And it's very difficult when something is covert to have um, the degree of confidence that you need that somebody actually carried it out. And it's very, very difficult to put a predicate on the table for your public to say, here's what they did and here's how I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond by bombing. Um, the, the Quds Force headquarters in, in, in Tehran. The, the exact same is true um, of cyber. Cyber, by its very nature, tends to be covert. Um, and therefore, it becomes, it becomes difficult to respond to. Um, and, and that's why you don't see a lot of response um, to, to the type of cyber activities that, that we see today. Um, so, so I don't think this is fundamentally different. Um, you, you know, if you think about the other domains, Ellie, um, you know, the, the ground domain has been around since the history of, of the first human. The sea domain has been around probably just as long, first time somebody put a boat in the water. The air domain has been around for only about 100 years. And the space domain, you know, for 50, 60 years. This domain for 10, 15, 20? 10 in a, in, a, in a significant way? So we're just at the beginning of working through how to think about it, um, how to think what the th about what the th how we want to use it to our national security advantage, how our allies want to use it to their national security advantage, how our adversaries want to use it, what they're learning. Um, you know, we were just we were just talking, for example, um, about 
I don't, I don't believe the intelligence community provided strategic warning on the Russian weaponization of social media. I certainly can't find it in any um, worldwide threat testimony going back any length of time. Um, a lot of talk about 9-11 style attack on critical infrastructure. There is, no ta there is no language in any of those documents about one of our adversaries using social, weaponizing social media against us. Um, so our adversaries are coming up with creative ways of, of, of using this domain um, against us. Um, and we're, we're trying to figure out um, how to protect ourselves. We're trying to figure out how to think about it. I think one of the really valuable things about your book is I think it's a major advance in, in, in helping us think about it. I think the other thing I'd say, and, and then go to the next question, I think the other thing I'd say is the objectives of the adversary are exactly the same. They haven't changed. So it's, it's been Russian policy for a long time to undermine the United States of America wherever it can in the world to weaken us, to undermine what we're trying to accomplish in different parts of the world. That, that's been Russian policy. And now they've got a new tool to do that, um, social media. Um, but the fundamental objective hasn't changed. Um, so that's kind of, a, I, I don't think it's fundamentally different. So let, let me then try and, and summarize in my own mind what I think I take away from you, but also what question I'm left with. The domain, the technical operational domain is different. The motivations are not. The tradecraft is not. Um, um, but maybe the policy dilemmas are somewhat different? So I think, yes, I think so. Um, so there are, there, are, there are differences of degree here. So I can't think of a single policy dilemma that is only true of cyber that isn't true in one of the other domains. For example, um, one, of the big, one of the big policy issues in cyber is the trade-off between security and privacy. Uh, it is possible for our government to do a much better job of protecting us from cyber threats. It is possible. Close the internet off to the rest of the world. Right? Nobody wants that. Um, nobody wanted, not a single person in this room would advocate for that, but that's possible. That's what other countries do. Um, and, and if you think about it in another way, right, um, the, the, the security of your home and your neighborhood, right, the police drive around all the time. Um, they might even flash a flashlight um, on your bushes, right? That doesn't, that doesn't bother you. That, doesn't un, that, that, that doesn't get at your sense of privacy and, and civil liberties. But to really understand what somebody's doing in cyberspace against you, they got to get inside that cyberspace. And that starts bothering you. So, but that, that security, privacy trade-off is true, it, it's true in some of the other domains. Absolutely it is. Um, it's just more true in this one. Um, you know, um, an, another example of, 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 of where this is more significant in cyber is um, the use of offensive cyber for defensive purposes. So when you see, when the government sees an adversary about ready to conduct an attack, does the government reach out and um, destroy that server that it's about ready to attack um, a U.S. company or the U.S. government? I, oh, that's a huge question. That's a huge question because that server is not in Iran or North Korea. It's in Switzerland or France because they've, they've hopped multiple servers, right? So um, that would be the physical destruction of a server in Switzerland. That would be, that, that would be conducting war against Switzerland, right? So it's a big, big deal to do that. Um, that's a particular problem in cyber, but it also exists. It also exists. In physical space, right? IRGC officers in Syria or in Yemen, right? What do you do about that? Well, it, 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 it makes it much more complicated, right, in, it, even in physical space. So um, I, I think there are some issues that are of heightened importance, policy issues, 
that are of heightened importance here, but I don't think they're completely unique. And the number of players and the type of players in this business, you think does fundamentally change the policy debate? So to me, the fundamental adversary is the nation states. Um, nation states have most of the capability. Um, organized crime um, is, is, a, is absolutely an adversary, um, but there's a relationship, significant relationship between, as you all know, between nation states um, and, and cyber crime organizations. Um, in some cases, the nation states are hiring the cyber crime organizations to do their work for them. In some cases, it's the same people doing the work, one during the day for Russian intelligence and the other at night for, uh, for Russian organized crime. Um, in most places on the planet where, 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 where cyber organized crime is a significant problem, the state abets it. The, the United in the cyber crime problem. After that, I don't particularly worry about terrorists and cyber. Um, I, I, I haven't seen, in, in the narrow sense, right, in the narrow sense of cyber attacks, um, in the use of social media to get their message out, that's a whole different issue. Um, but I haven't seen terrorist interests in using it to do damage, right? Terrorists like things to blow up. They like blood and death. Cyber does not cause that. Um, in fact, I can't think of a single death caused by a cyber attack to date. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, hacktivists, right, people who are just 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 have some social movement they're they're supporting is a pretty small problem. Um, the insider threat is is significant because of the access that an individual has, but but in totality, um, it's not cyber specific. It's either. not cyber specific either, right? Um, so I think the nation state is the fundamental actor here. So let me turn to the going forward. We need time. This new domain, but what is kind of a policy? recommendations would you make about the things that need to be, that need to evolve as we get better to deal with the confrontation in this new space? So the reason I like, I like the book so much, and I'm on the back saying nice things about the book. You should, you should all buy the book. You should all buy multiple copies of the book. <laughs> Thank um, you, Michael. You're welcome. Yes. Um, the reason I like the book so much is because it, tr it, 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 it's a serious effort to start thinking about your very question. Um, and you and I, f when you f we first talked about this, we were, we were at the Four Seasons, not too far from here, uh, having breakfast, and we were, we were kicking around ideas. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I think that we have the capacity to be creative and innovative to think about how we deal with this problem. For example, um, you know, the, 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 the three, the three big uses of, of cyber at the moment, four, I think I'd say now, post-election, um, cyber espionage, um, cyber crime, and cyber coercion. Cyber coercion is what the Iranians do, right, when they, when they attack US financial institutions, when they attack Aramco, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are the three fundamental cyber issues, and I think the fourth is now the, the, the weaponization of social media, which, by the way, um, did not end with the election. It, it is happening to this very day, and the Russians continue to use social media to try to divide um, Americans, to try to deepen social, racial, ethnic, gender divisions in the United States, trying to weaken us. It's happening to this very day. And it's happening in other countries in the world. Um, and other countries are starting to use the tool themselves. There's some evidence, for example, we were just talking about this upstairs. There's some evidence that the Chinese are now using this same tool um, in Australia. Um, so this is going to spread, right? So that's, that's, that's the fourth. OK, so what do we do about these? You know, If you're in a sit room and you're having a conversation about what do we do about them, well, let's take cyber espionage for a second. Well, part of cyber espionage I don't want to do anything about. 
because I want to be able to do it. Um, and you want me to be able to do it, right? So I think cyber espionage for the purpose of collecting national defense information, perfectly acceptable. So when the Chinese got inside of OPM, um, my thought as an intelligence officer was good for them. Good for them. Um, it, if I had the opportunity, if I were the director of NSA, if I were the director of CIA, and I had the opportunity to steal that same exact information from them, I wouldn't have had to ask anybody's permission, and I would have done it. Bad on us for not protecting it, right? So certain aspects of cyber espionage, it, it should be acceptable. Um, I certainly don't want to stop doing it because it, it's a valuable tool to protecting the United States of America. Um, the part of cyber espionage that is not cool, uh, is, not, is, is, is that we have to do something about, is the stealing of intellectual property for the purpose of enhancing the competitiveness of your own companies, um, which the Chinese continue to do, despite Xi Jinping's uh, commitment to President Obama to stop. Um, how do we do that? How do we do that? Um, well, one, one way, you and I talked about this a year ago or a year and a half ago now, um, and there's some indication that there's some movement in this direction, um, is to treat it as an unfair trade practice. So if, if the Chinese steal intellectual property from US steel companies, which they did, it's actually indictments, right? Um, that should be a WTO case, or that should be an FTC case that requires a remedy, that requires a financial remedy. Um, so that's, that's an example of a creative way of thinking about this, right? Um, on on cybercrime, I think there's, there's two possible creative ways of thinking about it, right, if you were sitting in the sit room talking about this. Um, one is, one is, you know, there was a time when Chinese industries were selling dual-use products, um, dual-use for, for uh, civilian use and military use uh, without a lot of controls. And um, many of these, many of these dual-use items could be used for WMD programs around the world. And the West put a tremendous amount of pressure on the Chinese government over a cons considerable period of time to get these dual use items under control. And guess what the Chinese eventually did? And they did it, they're doing a pretty good job of it. So um, in, in terms of cyber crime, we should be putting a tremendous amount of pressure on governments who are either um, abetting and assisting or turning a blind eye to cyber crime. Um, naming and shaming, um, diplomatic pressure, um, sanctions if necessary. Uh, you know, it should be on the front page of the New York Times, David. Um, you know, Washington Post. I mean, th th this, that's the way you get people's attention. Um, another Bribery appears too, yeah. Uh, uh, an another aspect of the cyber crime is some sort of international organization that focuses on it, right? That is able to follow up pretty much instantaneously to try to find out who the perpetrator was, and then to go, <coughs> go, go to that government and try to get action, right? And if you, can't get, if you can't get law enforcement action, then you turn back to the diplomatic approach, right? And this is not rocket science. Um, I think the tools that we use in physical space can be applied in cyberspace. We just gotta think about them. I think there's a danger, I, I, and I saw this around the sit room, um, and, and, and I see it in debates about how we should respond to what the Russians are doing to us, that if we get attacked in cyberspace, somehow we have to respond in cyberspace. And we don't, we, we don't at all, right? We don't at all. Um, if, we get attacked on the, if, if we get attacked on the ground somewhere, um, somebody blows up an embassy, um, we don't just respond on the ground, right? We respond using all of the physical domains. Um, and we should think about cyber that way. Um, in coercion is probably the hardest to deal with. 
um, because people like the Iranians and the North Koreans who, who, who are using coercion um, are smart enough to stay under the, the, under the red line, right? They're smart enough not to go far enough that requires a significant response. And so that's probably the hardest to deal with. I don't have an answer here. Um, but uh, there's, a lot, there, there, there's a lot of smart people um, thinking about this issue, and there's a lot of smart people in government um, that there's got to be answers to all of these things, and we just got to work them through. I would just add that there is a premise there <clears throat> that we didn't discuss, but maybe put up worth just noting that in the military space, the application of cyber is like applying any other type of tool of warfare and therefore lends itself to the same rules of the game, logic of employment, right. and so on, right? Yes. So therefore, we kind of singled out where we yeah. think that yeah, and the, the creativity I, is required. Yeah, yeah, the reason I didn't talk about, the reason I didn't talk about um, um, cyber war is because I don't think it would be used absent a hot war, right? And, and, and so, all right, yeah. perfect. Question from the audience? Just lift your hand, there will be microphones. Don't be shy. There. There'll be microphone rotating there, and if you have any questions about the book and so on. So. All right. Yeah. So, uh, how do you? determine the intent between stealing secrets for national defense information versus stealing those very same secrets for the purposes of intellectual property, right? So for instance, if a hostile nation steals information on stealth technology, are they using that to, it can go two ways. They can use it to build counter detection measures or apply that to their own aircraft. Right, it's still the same act, but there's two different outcomes. Right, so it, the question is, do they share it with their own industry, right, for the purpose of a competitive advantage? That's the difference, right? The United States of America has never done that. Most of our allies, not all of them, have ever done that. It's not like we did it once and stopped. We've never done that. That's not how we think about um, who we are as an economy and how we operate. Um, so it's 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 whether you share it, you know, with with your companies for the intent of a competitive advantage. There's another question here, please, Catherine. Catherine, did you move the microphone? Sorry. Okay, never mind. No, no, never mind. And then we'll we'll go to the first one. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm Peter Shutley, retired Foreign Service officer. And I was on the U.S. START delegation in the early 80s in Geneva. And my question is the prospects of some kind of a international accord or treaty or something to control cyber in some way. Where I'm coming from, and this is sort of an initial thinking, is we could talk to the Soviets about nuclear weapons by saying things like, what you're doing here, we consider a threat. So explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. I'm not sure that analogy works in cyber. If the, you tell the other side what you're worried about, you're revealing your weaknesses. So my question to you is, what are the prospects of some kind of an agreement that restrains cyber warfare potentially among key countries? Thanks. I'll let you, you, you've thought about this more than I have, actually. Well, uh, there are inherent challenges in applying it. And yet we uh, firmly believe there is room for trying to develop rules of the game in that space. At the moment, uh, the biggest challenge uh, with um, uh, cases like Russia uh, would be that they won't let themselves engage in that kind of a sincere dialogue of the nature that is necessary. Um, and clearly verification is much more difficult of a challenge in this space. That being said, I think uh, what um, Mr. Morel has referred to in terms of the US-Chinese dialogue um, and the ability to then follow up on it through diplomatic channels and so on is just one example. And I would add that one would start with, with an effort to try and codify some expectations 
uh, as a first building block. And those expectations could be conveyed privately, could be conveyed publicly, and then would be the building blocks of some broader understanding. So I don't think we are likely to see treaties and conventions emerge anytime soon. But I think the mere uh, calibration of expectations and the gradual evolution of rules of the game is both necessary and within the realm of the possible. We, we have to think very hard uh, uh, about the question Mr. Morel has referred to, which is where do we really want those rules and where we don't, because we believe that, for example, spying and cyber for national security purposes is perfectly legitimate. Leave it to its own kind of uh, uh, rules of the game that are unspoken. You know, maybe a very specific example, I mean, I agree with all of that. Maybe a very specific example is we start a conversation within the WTO about, about um, industrial espionage, right? Um, and boy, that's a tough place for the Chinese to be um, in that discussion, right? Because most of the players are going to have a pretty firm view here of, of what's right and what's wrong. And so it's a good place to start thinking, at, start a conversation where you might be able to get to some norms. I'm John Quinn, a lawyer in private practice here in Washington. We were comforted by your statement that there are plenty of smart people in the government, and many of those have had the opportunity to sit in the situation room that you've referred to dealing with these issues. We've also seen, particularly this year, examples of senior government people disregarding science, uh, having a completely different idea of the techniques that are, and the judgments that are relevant to national security, et cetera. Do you have reason to believe that the uh, same level of, of judgment and science is being applied by our government under the current administration that you've referred to? Yeah, um, so I'll say two things. Um, uh, the first is this too will pass, um, guaranteed. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is that, uh, is that Rob Joyce, who's, the, who's, who's, who's doing cybersecurity for President Trump, um, former National Security Agency um, officer, a very, very talented person, um, ran, ran the offensive program um, at NSA, um, I think is thinking about a lot of the things that we just talked about um, and is pushing forward um, pretty aggressively and he seems to have the running room that he needs from the administration. So I'm actually heartened um, by what I see Rob doing. Um, cer certainly not ready to, 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 to solve the big question of what is the government's role in all of this um, and exactly how is the government going to play with the private sector. Um, but I think Rob's made a lot of progress, and um, I, I feel pretty good about that. Thank you. One last question from the audience. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Bobby Pestron, a repurposed public health uh, official. This um, discussion has uh, been about international affairs and international relationships. Um, can you talk uh, briefly about the application of these same ideas within a nation, for example, domestically within the United States, where uh, companies or other actors uh, might be using these cyber, t cyber tools in relation to other uh, national organizations, businesses. Uh. So I think, I mean, I, I hope, I mean, I, if, if somebody's here from the FBI, maybe they can correct me. I mean, I, I, I hope that most of the, um, illegal cyber activities um, um, aimed at U.S. entities, whether they be persons or companies, um, are coming from outside the United States of America, um, not from entities inside. Uh, there's probably some of that, but I, I, I would think it was pretty small. You know, we haven't, we have not talked about um, the importance of security here. Um, it, it, it's absolutely critical. Uh, there was a great there was a great article in um, I thought a great article in the Cipher Brief last week or two weeks ago that really posed two two really interesting questions. One was the first one I raised earlier, which is why hasn't there been a major cyber attack on 
critical infrastructure. And the second is, is despite all of the warnings uh, and all of the risks associated with cyber, how come we're still so bad at cybersecurity? Um, you know, why do people pay so little attention to cybersecurity? You know, when these big companies um, uh, test their employees on phishing attacks, why do 25% of the employees still click on the link? You know, what's going on here? Um, and, and, and so security is really, really important here, um, both to defend ourselves and for, for, the, for the sake of deterrence, right? Because, because as you all know, basic deterrence theory is denying the, the adversary his or her objective, right? And then imposing costs. Well, the denying the objective here is security. And as I, as I said earlier, you know, the problem with the OPM hack was OPM, right? Um, and so security is extraordinarily important here. I think part of the problem, I think part of the problem, and time will sort this out too, I think part of the problem is that there are too many cybersecurity companies. And there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands. And the way I think about cybersecurity is sort of a tree with a bunch of branches. And each branch is something that you need to do to protect yourself. And the vast majority of cybersecurity companies only deal with one little branch. They don't deal with a whole tree. So there's a bunch of people showing up at your company all the time who say, I'm here to protect. I'm here to solve your cybersecurity problem. And C CEOs and COOs and, and CIOs and CISOs don't know what to do. There's just too many. Um, and, and what they really need is somebody who can deal with all those branches. And so I do think that eventually there's going to be a significant consolidation of the cybersecurity business, right? Um, if I were a PE firm, I would think about finding the best in class for every one of those branches and start buying them up and building that one, that, that one company. So I think eventually, you know, we're going to have four or five companies that do the whole tree. Um, and that consolidation is going to have taken place, but it's going to take years. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made there, I think. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons why our security is not as, as good as it needs to be is because people are scratching their heads about what do I do here? There's just, there's just too much out there. I would just compliment the answer and then uh, hand it over to George with two very quick remarks. One is we, this is a very international issue. The, the, the book is essentially uh, US centric, but we definitely want to encourage a follow up that brings international perspectives on this issue and so on. So hopefully that will be a next stage. But the second one, one of the unique challenges of, of cyberspace in, in trying to think through about policy solutions in this is, is that the dividing lines between domestic and international are more blurred than they are in the physical space. That big corporations are becoming an, a global players in this domain and so on, which is another complication. But just as to try and, and wrap up on, on, the, on the point that uh, Michael had made earlier, the question is how do we use the instruments that are currently available for the policing the domestic space? And I'm not talking just, just about government things, like insurance companies uh, would be the one that would set the standards of what is expected of you. Or litigation, or other things that would then ultimately drive this, the, the creation of order in that space uh, and so on. And uh, clearly also government interventions that would say, if this has international implications, you, you are likely to face extradition. You should understand that, uh, and so on. So we need to create kind of a hybrid of instruments, and that's one of the other issues we're working on. So thank you, Michael. He will remain in the, back, in the front seat for a little while longer in case as part of the follow-up uh, uh, discourse, you may have another question that just came to mind. So George, over to you. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. You want to sit when you get your sit your way. Come on, sit in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. That was um, a, a great start. I want to pick up just briefly on the the point that Michael was making at the end there about the importance of security and and how inadequate uh, it's been. Only to say that there's a great chapter in the book written by John Archea called Harbor Lights that, that goes back to World War II to explore why the east coast of the, of the United States 
the cities left their lights on for months, to ena which enabled the U-boats to destroy shipping uh, coming out of the East Coast uh, early in, in World War II, and what it took finally to get those lights turned off. And it's, 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 it's an apt uh, analogy because, I mean, the, the, the short answer is basically the mayors and businesses didn't want to undermine business in the evenings on, uh, in, in their towns and cities. Um, and it's, it's a private sector issue and what the limits of government uh, were in order to, to, to foster that kind of security. And so there is this kind of, uh, especially in, in, in this country, the, when, when so much is, is, um, is left to or where government's excluded from so many functions and it's private actors and there are millions uh, of them, how do you motivate uh, the kind of security behavior that, that you need. So um, I would commend that, that chapter to you. Um, I want to try to draw out some of the, the, the other themes that run through uh, the book. And I want to start by um, asking uh, Emily Goldman, who, who is a senior advisor to the commander of Cyber Command, uh, who's also the director of the National Security Agency. Uh, and, and Emily wrote the chapter on, on Pearl Harbor uh, in the book. Um, but I want to ask a, a little bit broader question of, of Emily. And this draws on the discussion we just had about Russia, uh, where there's another chapter in the book by Stephen Blank that looks at, at Russia's uh, behavior. And that chapter isn't really an analogy, but rather it looks to the beginning of the Soviet Union and through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, how, um, how then Soviet uh, intelligence uh, services used information warfare and believed in information warfare as part of the general political struggle uh, against largely the, the Western world. And the chapter was, was written before the revelations of the 2016 election uh, came out. But it's, it's remarkable to read it, and I, I urge you to read it, because you're just going to nod and go, uh-huh, uh-huh, seen that. Uh, it's, it's very um, uh, uh, consistent. And so the question to, to Emily uh, to, to start is, is in your thinking broadly about kind of, let's say, the last 20 years with, with, with cyber experience, is, is it most often the case that, that a country assimilates cyber technology to its normal operating procedures and its kind of the, the similar institutions command it and conduct the operations, so they're assimilating technology, or do we see the technology actually changing fundamentally the behavior, operations, strategic culture uh, of, a, of a country? Um, first of all, thank you, and um, I'm going to thank Carnegie and also um, you, George, and Ellie for uh, um, taking the idea that we had in 2012 um, to explore cyber analogies as a way to help people think through some of these complex problems and then taking it to the next level. Also, for Truth in Advertising, um, the, the paper or the article um, in the book was actually co-authored with Dr. Michael Warner right. back there, right who there. is the um, <coughs> command historian for U.S. Cyber Command. So anybody who's got any question about the history of where we've been, th th this man is, is writing the history. He actually um, has a great chapter uh, that he sole authored on intelligence and kind of how cyber changes intelligence or draws from kind of the history uh, of, of intelligence. Yeah. Um, and I would just say that um, kind of echoing what, um, what Michael was talking about in terms of um, thinking about cyber not as something different. I mean, there are aspects that are different, but I think we've come to believe that many of the things that you do with cyberspace operations, you do them with operations in the physical domains as well, whether it's intelligence and reconnaissance, targeting fires, et cetera. Um, and I think that it also follows the pattern of the diffusion of past military innovations that, you know, we're at a point, I would say it's, it's almost equivalent to the 1920s with air power, where you have the emergence of a capability and you've got different countries that are experimenting with how, how to do it, how to use it, how to fit it into their existing doctrine and organizations. Um, and um, they're experimenting with that and they're learning from each other as well. And I think that's where we are in cyber in terms of just the beginning of this journey. 
I think it's also a reason why it's going to be difficult to get international agreements on limiting it, because if I go back to my favorite period, the 1920s, once again, um, you did have arms control agreements, but they were on battleships, which was a mature technology. You had no agreement on submarines, which was a new technology. Countries are not willing to limit and constrain themselves on things that maybe they think they can leverage in unanticipated ways. It doesn't mean it can't happen, it just makes it um, more challenging. So that would be my kind of overall take on what we're seeing. Um. Let me ask another broad question for, uh, I'll, I'll start with David, but for, for either of you. And again, it draws, it draws a bit on the discussion with, with, with Michael <coughs> earlier. And it has to do with, with deterrence. And, and, and Michael was <coughs> talking about how we haven't had a, a major attack on critical infrastructure in part because deterrence works. And, and at the same time, they're, they're, when something does happen, whether it's the, the uh, Manipulation of social media, or wanna cry, or you know other rants. People say well, it's a failure of deterrence, um, and and we're not uh, we're we're not succeeding. So I guess the question is for and I'll start with 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 David is 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 deterrence, which basically became a dominant concept from the nuclear age, uh, is is it is it important and helpful, or is it misleading? that so much of our discourse and the expectation is about uh, deterrence. Do we need a, a, a different way of, of thinking about this? Well, it's a fascinating question. Um, let me just start by saying this is a great project to work on. And for uh, a news correspondent who spends their time you know, looking at the individual incidents and so forth, the opportunity that um, you, George, gave and, and Ellie uh, and everybody else involved in this project to sort of step back, write a chapter of the book. I did uh, the drones and cyber comparison, but mostly to hear the discussions about this, I found just enormously helpful, not only intellectually, but also just in thinking about how we formulate coverage of these issues. So I urge people to read it just because it will, it will change the way you, you are thinking about these. Um, deterrence is a fascinating question because as the nuclear chapter makes clear, and, and other work you've done, almost every question that comes up in nuclear deterrence also comes up in cyber deterrence. And almost every answer is different. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, for example, you know, MAD doesn't work out here because there is no assured destruction uh, in cyber. In fact, as Mike pointed out, rightly, if somebody isn't even willing to go take out the uh, power grid from, say, Boston to Washington, which would be hugely devastating, but not devastating uh, on the scale of a nuclear attack from Boston to Washington, um, what does that tell you about what works? And I think the answer lies a little bit in what Mike was saying before about covert versus overt. It would be hard to do a covert attack on the power grid. Uh, I just sat through two weeks ago Grid X, which is a once every two year exercise that the um, uh, power industry goes through. And they, in this case, were simulating a combination terror attack and cyber attack against a whole host of different critical elements of the, um, uh, of the grid. And two things you know, struck me out of this. One was the government players weren't thinking very much in terms of deterrence. And secondly, it was going to become pretty clear pretty quickly where the attacker came from, even if you didn't know exactly who the attacker would be. So if we think of this in the broad level of something that is so large that it's likely to bring about a, uh, a perhaps a military response, but certainly a severe response, then I agree deterrence is already working. The problem is that for most cyber attacks that we have seen, they are all at the um, short of war level. So the Russians could have been doing an awful lot more with social media 
nobody was going to sit around the Situation Room and suggest that we take out a Russian city or conduct a military operation in response to a social media attack, even when it came to the suspicion of the manipulation of voting machines, something that's a little more physical, doesn't really just get to the information people are getting, but actual manipulation of data. Nobody would have suggested that, although there would be a range of things you could do and a range of things that President Obama attempted in the last days of his campaign. And we've all been reading about those lately because they get right to the, the charges about uh, General Flynn. Um, I would argue that if you looked across the breadth of the Obama years, and maybe the Bush years before that, but certainly the Obama years, and the range of cyber activity that took place, there was almost no deterrence created. So think about our categories here. Um, there was the threat of coming back after the, the Chinese for the theft of intellectual property. It did result in an agreement that had, I think, some, some good, good effects. And that threat was basically going to be sanctions. Um, in the North Korea case of Sony, there were a few sanctions thrown against North Korea for its activities against Sony. And that was sort of the purest case of a destructive cyber attack. It took out about 70% of Sony Pictures uh, Entertainment's computing system. So there was a physical effect, and yet a tiny response. In the case of Russia, prior to the election hack, there were hacks on the White House, on the State Department, on the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and the government of the United States would not even name the Russians as the suspected uh, offender here even though everybody knew they were. And I would sit in these lengthy interviews with you know, State Department officials or whatever, and they were told never to um, go and uh, mention the word Russia in the course of the interviews. So I think one of the things that we've got to figure out how to do is come up with regular expected penalties for sub-conflict level cyber attacks if we are going to have any significant hope of creating some level of deterrence. George, just, just briefly to jump in to make two very quick points. The first is I would actually start building on the terminology that um, Michael had laid down. Namely, I'm not sure we should talk about deterrence as much as we should talk about coercion, persuasion. And I would say a category we haven't talked about, but which we, the two of us have discussed a lot in the, in the last chapter is restraint. There are a lot of restraint out there that has nothing to do with deterrence as such, or even with persuasion, and everything to do with the fact that there is some specific aspects of cyber that hold you back from going all out. So that's one point. The second thing is that I think one of the conceptual challenges we have in trying to think about coercion, persuasion, and restraint in this space is that we're not neatly talking about, which again is a point that Michael had made, about things happening exclusively in the cyberspace or being responded to exclusively in the cyberspace. There is often a combination of the two, both in the, the challenge and in the response. And that ought to be the case. We shouldn't hold ourselves back to try and do, or look of all these, it could be sanctions that are the response, it could be uh, um, some uh, cyber activity, it could be some other types of diplomacy and agreements and so on and so forth. So, so I think the, the challenge for us is to actually think of how does the marriage of this with the physical space as distinguished from separating it from the physical space is, is what we need to look at. Emily, yeah. So um, let me try to take a little, put a different lens on this. Um, first of all, I think it's important when we talk about deterrence that we separate deterrence as an effect from deterrence as a strategy. I think we can all agree that we want deterrence as an effect. The mm -hmm. question we're asking here is whether a strategy of deterrence, um, which in, implies a, a prospective reaction to an activity, is the best way to get deterrence as an effect. Um, and I think that if we go back historically, we you know look at it in the 1950s when, with the advent of, of nuclear capabilities, 
there were strategic thinkers who, who realized that there was something unique about this technology that essentially you could not defend. Therefore, how do you create security when you cannot defend? And they came up with the idea of deterrence, um, and, and they you know, theorized on that, and we have concepts of crisis stability and escalation control, and all of these concepts are part of a, a framework that worked really, really well for a very long period of time and still works today. But I would argue that what we should be asking is not how do we deter, but how do we secure in cyberspace? And is deterrence an effective strategy to get us to security? And I think we're really locked into a, a framework that maybe doesn't map to the cyber, um, the cyber reality, okay? Because in cyberspace, you can defend, it's just you only defend in the moment, okay? Because the terrain is constantly changing. Um, and it's not what we call an offensive dominant environment where the offense always prevails because you can defend. Um, so we've been talking, you know, we've been thinking a lot about, you know, in, in the cyber space as well, in a, in a domain of, of constant contact where you're constantly coming up against adversaries, allies, private sector in this domain. You cannot, um, because it's so interconnected, you cannot get away from that. You know, how does um, a, a strategy that says don't do anything until you get attacked makes sense, right? So um, what we're seeing, I think, and it kind of goes to part to what David was saying, is that, you know, I would argue that deterrence works for cyber attacks that have physical consequences like destruction and warfare, death and destruction. I think that that's why we haven't seen that. But what we are seeing are persistent, intrusions and attacks across the political, military, social, economic sphere below the level of armed conflict, below the level that would trigger an armed response, and we're not responding to that. Persistent basis. And I would argue that our restraint it actually emboldens the adversaries. Um, so we have to think about you know, how do we contest that type of activity, and over time, um, our, our adversaries may come to realize that these sorts of activities are futile. Um, but right now, what we're seeing is these are going on continually, and I would argue that the accumulation of those is having a strategic impact on our national power, um, political, military. So, so I guess my, my point is, is just to say, um, let's step back and let's ask the question as opposed to presuming the answer, that the answer is deterrence, a strategy of deterrence. Let's ask, what is the best strategy to get security? I'm going to turn to David on this, and then we'll open it up. But I, I, I just want to add, on, on many of these issues or dynamics, a number of states would say that the US has been doing this to them, historically right. and in many other ways, if not through cyber, through information, television, Absolutely. Western culture, West toxification. Uh, subverting their societies, trying to manipulate their elections, getting uh, their and, and and so forth, and so it is a, right. a, 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 a an even more fraught dynamic. The idea that that, that uh, we haven't responded, they they would laugh and say, but we "You started." It. Right. Um, so it's and, a very active. That's, yeah, that's a, yeah. a big, big problem. I mean, you don't have to go to adversaries for this. Go to Canada. And hear them complain about American TV and its, you know, influence on them. Right. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something uh, that Emily said on, on deterrence by denial here. So the concept is, if your security is good enough, if your denial is good enough, people aren't going to bother. They're going to say this isn't going to work, so they'll go away. Um, the best way that we can do that is by anticipating attacks, and the best way we can anticipate attacks is by putting implants in foreign systems and foreign networks, or one of the best ways that we can. And we do a huge amount of that. We don't talk very much about it, but we do a huge amount of that. Uh, and it's interesting when you go back over some of these cases, including the Russia case, go take a look at how we first saw evidence that they were messing around in the DNC. It was not necessarily from what we saw at the DNC. It's where this stuff was all ending up. So that then gets to Mike's interesting distinction before, where he said he, he doesn't want any rules about espionage because we want to be able to go do that. And the difficulty in the cyber realm for this, I, I agree with him that, that that's the natural instinct, is that the same implant that you put in a foreign system 
to do the espionage that Mike made the good point we don't want to be able to limit ourselves from is the exact same implant that uh, your friends at Cyber Command could come in and make use of if they wanted to go do an attack. So we see implants in our systems, let's say in the power grid, and we say, oh my god, you know, they're at any point, black energy, the Russian-based uh, malware that was sitting there, could be used to go shut down our power grid. It hasn't been, but it could be, or some other element of this. And so when somebody detects this implant, they don't know whether it's actually for espionage or they go to the next conclusion, which is they're actually preparing the battlefield for doing an attack. And that makes this distinction that we were discussing in the first panel all the more complicated. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how we work our way around that, because we could never convince the Chinese or the Russians or the Iranians or the North Koreans that that implant that they've just discovered, eh, don't worry about it, it's espionage, we do it, you do it, you know, all that. Just as we are not convinced of that when we see it in our own system. Again, I would commend Michael Warner's chapter on intelligence for, for bringing out uh, some of these uh, dilemmas as well. I want to uh, o open it up, but, but with also a plug for a, another chapter that, that I'm reminded of uh, through this discussion. Nicholas Lambert is a, a British historian, has a chapter uh, that's, that's quite fascinating on uh, uh, Great Britain's use of economic warfare at the beginning of World War I, um, which was uh, w which because they had the strongest navy, they had the world's leading uh, economy, they basically controlled the financial sector. Uh, they, they struck, in a sense, early in, in the war against Germany uh, to, to shock the German uh, economy. And it worked so well within four or five weeks that the blowback in the British economy on, and the financial sector and trading sector was so severe that domestic organizations in Britain went to the government and said, you have to stop this, you're, you're ruining us. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the US vulnerability uh, as the state that depends perhaps more on, on cyber commerce cyber tools that's also the biggest uh, exporter uh, of these capabilities uh, that if you if you start throwing rocks uh, at, at others uh, kind of we're perhaps the most vulnerable and susceptible um, to rocks coming uh, back at us and so I, I urge people to look at but you know just just yeah. to add George but I think that's where it sets apart China and Russia that because right. the Chinese have such a stake in right. the system they right. mean amenable to the type yep. of norms that, that Michael was talking about, and the problem we have now with Russia is they don't feel they have a stake in the system, and that doesn't hold them back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's uh, open it up for questions, discussion. Uh, there, this gentleman here. Hi, Ronald Marks. Um, I've owned or run a number of IT firms or software firms over the years. The concept that we often use was risk management in the sense of I'm not going to be able to invest, I mean, I could invest my entire firm's revenue in security, and it's not going to work. Uh, if not, I'll have some angry 25-year-old IT guy inside, uh, you know, mucking me up. question I have for you on the government level is what kind of thoughts have we had in terms of engaging in a form of risk management? Always seems to me that every time you're trying to protect everything, that you're actually not protecting all that much. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I think that... Um, it, it, we're very much adopting that risk management approach. I mean, I think you see that. Let's, let's look at the Defense Department, first of all. I mean, the, the, the primary mission of the command is to defend U.S. military systems, right, to defend those platforms. And it is a, a challenge to identify where the, you know, the critical kind of centers of gravity are, what is, what is critical terrain, in essence, that we have to. We have conversations like that all the time. Um, in many cases, because you know the Defense Department rides on the critical infrastructure of the private sector, and it's really hard to see where things, you know, start or where thing where things end. Um, 
you try to be mindful of the fact that the better you get at security, your adversaries are going to go after the soft underbelly, and they're going to look at ways to get in through contractors, for example. Or so, um, but I think that there is a recognition that it, it is it is a, about managing risk. It's not being risk averse, but it's being risk management. So I see that clearly in the defense arena. Let me compliment the answer because I think that one of our major errors of our recent research that isn't public yet is precisely on the question that you phrased. I would be very wary about the government's uh, ability to actually manage that space for the private sector for reasons that part of when, which already been articulated by Emily, namely the government is primarily preoccupied with protecting its own networks and then with critical infrastructure. And there are also inhibitions about a moral hazard that if you actually protect, try to protect the private, the private sector, you get into all kinds of issues that are where you don't really belong. Uh, we have looked at these physical analogies of what it is that you're actually telling private citizens, you should look after your home or your corporation and so on. And so the where we are ending up increasingly is a very different balance between government and, the, and private sector mechanisms. I've already mentioned insurance. Where, you, for example, I would see the, the SEC requiring reporting requirements, but the reporting requirements would merely be designed to get consistent and comprehensive risk management practices within corporations. Because I don't think the government is the most capable institution to actually think about risk management and cyber for private companies, including with a consideration of where do we put the money in, and whether the strategy should be self-insurance, resiliency operations, uh, contracting out or or actually saying this is a risk that we can withstand and and that's why we are now increasingly looking at what can one do and and there are institutional aspects but not just in terms of, of, of um, uh, uh, the kind of cape tools that you deploy for example if you begin to think about it the CISO is in one side of the operation the risk management resides with the CFO it's in a different side of the corporations and they rarely talk to each other so what this requires is a very fundamental shift in outlook, and that's where we are now trying to look at private sector mechanisms of an existing nature that would be harnessed to deal with the cybersecurity threat. Can I just add one? I mean, so we talked about government, private sector. Let's talk about the individual. Let's talk about, so how many of you, you know, have bought a major appliance recently? Like a refrigerator, okay. So if you went into the store and you're gonna buy this appliance and they say to you, okay, it's gonna break down, you know, there's gonna be bugs with it. It's gonna probably break down every week. But don't worry about that, and we'll fix it for free. Um, and you don't even have to be home, okay? Just leave your door open, and we'll come on in and we'll fix it. Would you buy that refrigerator? Probably not, but that's what we tolerate in software, right? And so there's a question of, you know, the power of, of people to say this is what we demand in terms of more secure products um, which will incentivize I mean we realize nothing is going to be a hundred percent secure right you have to be able to operate in a degraded environment whether it's you know individually or that's just the nature of it it's not going to be a hundred percent but we certainly could be a lot better and we should be better uh, yes back back right there Hi, um, my name is Alex Lawson. Um, I work for Freedom House, and my question is going a little bit off of the private industry um, and government, um, and that is especially given um, talking about weaponizing social media and things like this um, and the other issues brought up. What role do you see for um, private industry to kind of like raise that? Um, what is the relationship? Do you think that it's going to change or what is it going to look like in the future to kind of tackle these cyber issues given the immense power that we now see these social media and other cyber platforms having? Well, a partial answer. You're asking a very complicated and a much uh, a different answer than, than the, the focus of the book. So I will just see, be very brief and say the following because the book has obviously t talked about cyber conflict. You know, th there are a lot of social issues that come up and cultural issues that come up as we were trying to s think of what the private sector ought to do, what not to do, and so on. And they vary from one country to the other. Some want the more and more centralized answers big by tradition. I mean, we were talking to the French, for example. They have a much more centric approach than they do have in the United States where the private sector 
is, is so on. So we don't know that we can get the global answer because there are cultural differences across countries and so on. There is also a different concept about what you actually want to do, uh, what you see as, as part of a competition, right? If as a competition you have five big corporations emerging in a space, uh, uh, okay, and you do not, you decide for reasons that are cultural or political and so on, not to apply antitrust against them, right? I mean, do we want to see a similar process of consolidation also in the cybersecurity domain? Or we don't, and how would they actually work with each other? So we're getting into a very complicated question here. All I would say is, therefore, that we need to adjust to find some way of, of creating a level playing field and at the same time adjust it culturally to, to you know, the kind of the different systems. And different systems will come out with different answers on this issue and so on. So we, uh, as Carnegie, what we're trying to do is to find some common elements that one can actually think about where you can forge international collaboration but still have a lot of leeway for, for different uh, uh, entities to actually run it the way they see is, is more befitting their political and cultural system. I mean, also just to the, the, to the extent that you were talking about kind of the, the, the use and abuse of social media and things like that, you're good. I mean, you already experienced this. Um, whatever happy days or loose, uh, uh, delusional days we had in the 90s about kind of our model uh, uh, kind of taking over the world or being celebrated around the world and adopted around the world, you know, that's been gone for a while, but, but in, in, in China, you know, they, they look at what happened uh, in the election and all that here, and you see, you see, uh, you know, this is why we don't do it that way. Uh, and in and, and other cultures, too, you know, you keep the creeps off, uh, you know, you, you, you block things, um, you, you pr protect people from this kind of abusive discourse, misinformation, uh, and so on. It's, it's, how they will uh, perceive it. So I would expect that you're going to see kind of more variety in the expectation that, that um, we had and that Facebook and others kind of propagated of like this is the way of the world. Um, that's going to be undone, uh, you know, o over time would be, would be one good. One, one qu very quick thought on this just from sort of a more news media kind of perspective. A year ago, Facebook would not have considered itself in any way a journalistic operation. Yeah. They thought of themselves as a big pipe into which people put all of their personal information and their pictures and their friends and all that, and they found ways to sell advertising around that, and that was the business model. Then a few things came along in the past few years, as George alluded to. So we all came to an agreement, child pornography has got no place inside that pipe, so we took it out. ISIL beheadings had no place inside that pipe. So YouTube figured out an algorithm very quickly, all that. Well, those were the easy cases because it's fairly easy to design an algorithm or train some people to figure out what's child pornography and what a beheading video looks like. It's a lot harder when you get to the kind of political messages that we saw taking place in the election. And harder still, because if anybody up here in the stage or anyone out here in this audience posted those behind their real name for you know secession in Texas or something like that, you'd be completely within your First Amendment rights. You'd say, we might agree with you, we might disagree with you, but you certainly have the right to go put that up on Facebook. When we have a foreign power doing it with the exact same content, we have a very different thought. And that requires then an editing function in the social media organizations that they have always been allergic to. And I was with some Facebook friends recently, and I said to them, are you these know. like friends of yours on Facebook? No, or friends at, at these were friends at Facebook, okay. I should say, okay. right? Okay. And I said to them, you know, I think five years from now, you could end up being the largest employer of journalists in America, mostly editors. You're now calling this content reviewers or something like that, but we've called that editing since mm -hmm. Gutenberg, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's sort of where they're headed. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the uh, lady in the middle, and then the gentleman two rows behind, and if we have time, we'll come back to you. Um, 
cyber technology has gotten to the point where it boggles my mind, and I've heard even that the chips and phones are cyber and go into, you know, obviously into cyberspace. Uh, is there any point where individuals are not safe because of the access uh, the cyber world has to the goings on of individual lives? Well, there's one thing you can do to completely protect yourself, which is that you can destroy your cell phone, you can get rid of your Alexa, you can take away your smart TV, you can move to the woods of Montana in a small cabin and get rid of basically anything that transmits. That's 100% protection, but that's the only one I can think of. So. I, I guess the only thing that I would say is that, um, it, that we as a society have to decide how, you know, how much of that information that we want out there. I think that it's, even though people would think this is counterintuitive, but there's far more restraints and oversight on government and what it can look at than there is on the private sector. Um, and so I don't think people realize when they download an app and they agree, yes, 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 and you know, then they're releasing a tremendous amount of information. So I think we have to become smarter about that and you know, look at um, sort of realistically the way the private sector has access to a lot of different information. And with artificial intelligence and with big data, I mean, the ability to use that, right, and to, to mine that information, <coughs> and you know, that makes data itself as, as a target now. For, for countries to try to steal like OPM because now they can actually process it and use it and figure out something. So um, I, I think, you know, there are some big changes that are coming down the line that we're going through now, but we need to look, you know, we as a society to have that conversation about what we're willing to put out there and what we feel is sort of off limits. And every society may have, it may strike absolutely. a different balance. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And it's fascinating that people in this room who are perfectly happy to let Facebook and Google have that data would be protesting outside your offices right. if the NSA had access to that data. Or even to the metadata, yeah. Or the metadata, yeah. Right. Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, I mean, there you go. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Roberts, I, I teach uh, computer science students who want to go into cybersecurity. What are the most important skills beyond the technical ones uh, for students seeking a career in cybersecurity? You employ probably more of those. Um, be happy to talk with you about <laughs> having some of your students come work for us. But um, I, I, I think that you're right in the sense that the technical piece is very important, um, but there's also a really important human piece and a cognitive piece. So I think having an interdisciplinary um, training is going to help um, those students become more more competitive. Um, I think that um, in so, I mean, there's a huge private market for that, right? They're going to get paid a lot more than they would if they were to go into government. But, um, you know, going into government, you're working on, you know, a really profound mission. I think we should sort of come out here today, these, these challenges about how do we as a society protect ourselves and yet also um, allow ourselves to have access to the benefits of, of, of this free and open cyberspace. Um, so that would be my major suggestion is, you know, interdisciplinary. Don't forget the human piece um, and be able to be a really good writer. That's also important. So just to, to add to what uh, Emily had said, maybe George would also want to come in. I think that the, um, if we talk about, the, talk about the analogy of nuclear weapons or biological weapons, it became clear that those who have, you know, sort of were the biologists and the nuclear physicists and so on gradually became to understand that what the technology they were developing, or what science they were developing, and then the technology they were developing did have strategic, social, cultural implications and so on. And so over time, they understood that there was a responsibility that came from with innovation. We are now trying to do two things. We're trying to do it for cyber that is already a, a sort of hugely out there. And we're trying to anticipate what's coming up next in terms of artificial intelligence and synthetic biology and so on which are the next kind of technologies and so on. He's so I would say- about our, our technology and international affairs program here at Carnegie is what I was referring so, to. So what I would say is what one thing you want to sensitize your students is to the sum of the broader implications of the development of their technology and the choices they make in what to develop and how to develop and who to consult 
and what issues to think about and so on. The only one I would add to this is that I discover in, as I uh, do some teaching and also engaging with our readers, that you get a group of people who think that the solutions out here are technological, and then you get a group of people who think that the solutions out here are political, and it comes more out of what they've been trained in, where they've come up. And what was fascinating about the nuclear age was you got to a point by sort of the late 50s where at places from the Belfer Center, what is now the Belfer Center at Harvard, but also out at MIT and uh, projects here at Carnegie, certainly at RAND, you began to get the technologists, the political types together, uh, some sociologists together, and that's what began to give rise to the deterrence theories that we were discussing before. You know, Henry Kissinger's book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy, which was probably the first popular book on uh, nuclear uh, deterrence issues, came out in 57 or 58, 57. yeah, it was the product of exactly that kind of combination. And yet when I go around to many of the programs where you've got students working on cybersecurity issues, and I begin talking to them about the possible political solutions, like what we discussed before. Is there a treaty, are there treaties for this? Is there, are there norms we can discuss? It's usually the first time that they've actually thought about those issues. I, I mean, just I would wrap up on that, on, on, on that, 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 and again, that's one of the motivations for the book, but, you know, history, having a sense of history, learning some history of technology, uh, as well as then, as Emily said, because you can't overestimate uh, the importance of being able to write, which is a rarer and rarer um, uh, skill, and yet in organizations is uh, absolutely uh, vital. Um, I think we've run out of time, so I apologize to the, to the gentleman in the, in the back, but I want to um, thank you all for coming. I want to thank uh, David and Emily and Michael uh, for writing and Ellie for writing uh, and being here. Again, this is uh, a product of the Cyber Policy Initiative here at, at Carnegie and, and stay tuned. We're doing um, a lot more policy relevant uh, work that we're going to be publicizing uh, in the next, uh, in the coming, in the coming years. So thank you very much again for Thank for you. Coming. Thank you.